Yeah. I'm on vacation. Her hips so locked. I seen her eyes. They just my type. She tell me that she's singing low with some. I just make sure that they ain't no older brothers and I'm in there. Lock and off. Chase to the weekend rock and roll. She want the ball. I tell her crouch and hop. We steady burning trees until we yawn. Then we ask the crew. Who got a bar up in the morning? Who's gonna roll up in the morning? Said who got bar up in the morning? There are some powerful, powerful conversations are happening out there in the corridors of the Michael Fowler Centre. That has um, meant that some people are a little late. So the cats are being herded and we are starting in 60 seconds. Watch these cats run into the room and thank you, especially Trussell, who's joined us today for being early and punctual. Let's give a round of applause to Trussell, our favourite introvert as a role model for punctuality. 60 seconds. You can keep chatting for the next 60 seconds and then we'll kick off. Tēnā 
And so this morning, uh, we, we thought we'd open our, our day uh, in Karakia as per the program. And, um, and we're going to do a bit of a tag team with that one. And um, we're going to warm up our koro koro with a, with a waiata. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so I've asked the brother to come up and uh, share in this platform. So today, uh, we're going to pray for our day. We pray today. We want to pray for our teachers. Amen. Totoro, kapai. They're as precious as uh, youth workers. Yo, and um, as valuable as what I really meant. And uh, we want to acknowledge um, too. There, there's, so, there's in, the, in the last few days we've had such an awesome day. We, we want to pray thanks really uh, for the for the awesome uh, contribution of uh, wealth and talent and abilities in, in the sharing. And so, tēnei te wā ki te tukua te rau wakamuti o ake tai. Kei a koe e met. Kia ora. Um, can I please have everybody standing up to your feet for karakia? Um, because we are in um, uh, Te Atiawa ki Pūneke, um, Taranaki Whānui, Whenua, um, some of our greatest teachers uh, was Te Whiti and Tohu, um, who are the leaders of Parihaka. So um, I feel to start us off with um, the Karakia He Honore, and then we'll continue on with the Karakia, and I hand it over to Matua. So Kia Nui Tātou, let us pray. He Honore, He Kororia ki Te Atua, He Maunga Rongo ki Te Whenua, He Whakaaro Pai ki Ngā Tangata Kātua. Hanga e te atua hi ngā kou hau i roto i tēnā, i tēnā mō mātou. Atna reirea ki ako e ho ngā mano. Tūruri wai ori au ki tonu te rangi me te huenua te rau waka mointi, waka o tai. Mō ona mana ki tanga mai i te tima tanga taina mai ki tēnei, wahanga te atana. Mbe i te pua te ata, ka inui ana mātou ki ako e i mua te koutou aro aro. Mō koutou tini mana ki tanga ki a mātou i nā rangi e pahure. Taere mai ki tēnei rā. Mana ki hia mai i ngā rōpū, i ngā hunga taiohi, me ngā hunga kaiarehi. Te rōpū waka haere. Mana ki hia mai ki a mātou nā mana wahine, nā mana tāne, nā mana o ngā hunga katoa kai waini o tātou. Hapai tia mātou i tēnei rā. Mana ki tia mai ana kaupapa waka ahere o tarāne. E nei nga tono nga ki atu ki a koutou nāreki. Hei tātou mai anō koutou ki waini o mātou, hei tātou ri ngā kupu katoa, e waka pūke nga nga mātou i roto i tō koutou kororia tanga. Ko koutou nei hoki te timatanga me te wakutinga mai i ngā tūmanako tango katoa. Manaki hia hoki ki ngā kaiako o te motu. Manaki hia ki ngā tamariki mokopuna o tātou. E ngā mawi ana, e ngā taimahatanga, e ngā pauritanga. Me ngā whānau pani o te motu. Manaki hia ngā pakeke kaumātua. Kei waini o tātou. Kei wainui i ngā whare kainga, kei roto o konei, kei roto i ngā ohipera, i ngā whare o ngā kaumātua. Mana ki hia ngā kai arehi o te motu, a tātou nei kaunihera, a tātou nei rōpū i te whare pare matahoki, a rātou ngā kai arehi mō tātou. Mana ki hia hoki a tātou nei wahanga kaupapa, a nga taiohi, a nga rangatahi, a nga hunga taihoi o te motu. E nei nga tonona ki atu ki a koutou nāreki, waka moimiti tea, waka whetai. I runga tingo tapu hoki o te matua te taumata wairu tapu. Me waka ho nere ki ngā ne pono nga kai mahi, nga kai kere, nga kai tiaki i te au i te pō. I te au i te pō. Ko te mānga e ngā rī ki te kai waka mārama e hei tautoko mai tūturu waka pūmai ki te koroia tanga. 
ko i hukaiti te tamate matua i ngā wā katoa i ngā wāhi katoa wā ke tonu ake āmeni āmeni kia ora mai e noho kia ora ania Good morning Involve, it's our last day. How exciting is this? And you must be so excited because we're about to bamboozle you with a few minutes of exciting housekeeping notices before we welcome on our keynote for this morning. We want to welcome the new people to the room. There are a number of you and so we thought it would be really, really good to just kind of connect you with some of the kōrero that's happened over the last day and a half. And man, it feels like we have travelled. feels like we have travelled some distance, which is actually exactly what we're supposed to have done at this point in the programme. And the final day is amazing. Our theme is, for this conference, Involve 2018, is pausing to reflect on where we've come so that we may move forward together. And in order to help us kind of make sense of that theme in terms of what's happened so far, certainly yesterday on the program, and provide some hot tips for what you guys need to get to today in a big, diverse, and pretty overwhelming kind of program, we would love to invite some of our beautiful partners up onto the stage uh, from the New Zealand Youth Mentoring Network, from the Society of Youth Health Professionals of Aotearoa New Zealand, from the Collaborative, and from Korowai Tupu or Arataiohi and Arataiohi to come up and give us their hot takes. Let's give these wonderful organising people a round of applause. <laughs> so it's my great privilege to introduce Nikki McDonald, the Director of the New Zealand Youth Mentoring Network. Hi everyone. Um, so Anya's just asked me to give an, um, from yesterday a reflection on what I, I really enjoyed. Um, I'd have to say um, the session in the morning on attunement, I finally understand what that's about um, and how as a mentoring organisation we can um, use that skill. So, and then today, while I can't really go past our mentoring panel looking at quality relationships this morning, here at 11.15. Thanks Anya. And we've got a couple of people from the collaborative here. We've got uh, Sophie, who's representing young people, and Ria, who's representing old people. <laughs> Can I ask Ria first? Ria, what was your highlight from yesterday? My highlight from yesterday was totally the youth-led uh, design session. Um, while we have some pretty inspirational uh, young people out there, and most most welcomely was our, our refugee young people. They are new to our community, and they are rocking it, and they are contributing so much. It's fantastic. Loved it. Awesome. And Sophie, what's your hot tip for today? Um, I'd say that we need to um, make sure that we're remembering how to carry on from this conference, and to take stuff home, and to not forget everything that we've learned, and to continue growing our connections. Too much. Awesome. Uh, may I, it's my great pleasure to introduce Leanne O'Brien, who is the uh, chairperson of the Society of Youth Health Professionals of Aotearoa New Zealand. Tell me, Leanne, what was your favourite thing from yesterday? Let me borrow this. Hey, uh, thanks, Anya. Man, it's been so great. Um, the food, I just can't stop talking about the food. It's just awesome. But um, connections, again, like, um, I didn't know that there was this dude from Nelson, and when we stood, I went, woo, Nelson! There he was, and we've made this awesome connection, as I have with other people here, has been amazing. And just the breadth of knowledge, the breadth of experiences that we have, and actually being able to share that burden too sometimes, because it's pretty hard out there with the things that we do, but actually we're all on the same walker together, so love that. And this afternoon, what I'm looking forward to is, um, I've got a workshop a bit later on, um, just after lunch, I think that's going to be so great. Um, it's Heads, so if you haven't heard about Heads, just... Um, I'm pretty awesome, so I'd love to see you. Shameless self-promotion. That wasn't in the brief she is Awesome. We were swimming off the stage. Prepared for that. Well, maybe there's shameless more self-promotion coming. I'm not sure. You're not that kind of person. Jane Zintel, Aratahi, Korowai Tupu. What were your highlights from yesterday and looking forward to today? 
Awesome. Highlight for me program-wise yesterday was the Looking Back panel. Uh, we had 134 years of experience between four people sharing their experiences as they reflect back on uh, youth development, youth work, youth health in Aotearoa. Uh, particular highlight would have to be Dr Sue Badshaw doing a mini strip tease in the middle of the program. Uh, you are able to see this via our Facebook page, so um, uh, I will not say any more so I don't give away the surprise. Uh, for today, if I wasn't at my own workshop, um, I would be going to uh, Lloyd Martin's workshop on the Wounded, Lo uh, Wounded Learner project that he's involved in. That's 11.15 this morning. Thank you, Jane. Hey, let's uh, another round of applause for these four wonderful organisations. Anya, if Jane Zintel is um, telling us she enjoyed a striptease with Code of Ethics awareness, then it must have been legit. Um, all right, you want to do some mega thanks? I do. I want to do some mega thanks to all of these people who we have acknowledged at other times, the Drug Foundation, our really amazing friends, also at the Health Promotion Agency, the Wellington City Council have done us a solid with helping us out with the venue, the Ministry of Youth Development helped us to get a whole lot of young people who work with young people into the room, the Ministry of Health, the Vodafone Foundation, our Fano at Lifehack, all of these people have actually enabled all of this to happen. There's another list of people who There's are in your programme who we really want to mihi to as well. We want to give some Love to the Wellington City Mission who donated those beautiful coffee mugs, um, to Family Planning, to the Rata Foundation and the Wayne Francis Charitable Trust who got lots of people from Canterbury here, the Otago Community Trust, Levar, Supreme Coffee and all of the amazing people who have contributed as, as members of the local rōpū here in Wellington. Um, we want to acknowledge our amazing external site host, Welltech, Praxis, Zeal, Evolve, Wellington City Council and the West Plaza Hotel. And finally, um, we got some really amazing support from some local businesses, including Fix and Fog, Garage Project, you might have to come tonight for that, um, Six Barrel Soda, Biz Dojo and the amazing Stories Coffee uh, Cart, which is just up Cuba Street. So nga mihi and big love to all of those people who've helped us. Mega appreciation. All right, we've got some notices. Uh, the first is some, you know, we've tried pretty hard on our carbon footprint here. The land lanyards are made out of bamboo. I don't even know how that's possible, but it's true, they're bamboo. And um, they say, I'm involved in youth development, so you can continue to wear these in your mahi if you uh, should so choose. Otherwise, if you think, you know, don't need a lanyard, that's cool, please return it to the info registration desk and we will reuse these lanyards to keep the eco-sustainability going. I think I'm going to talk about sweet merch. That's good. So you guys can, uh, I really loved Sophie's encouragement to think about how it is that we kind of continue the conversation. One way you could do this is by buying a t-shirt and every time you put it on you'll be like, mm, how am I going to sustain that conversation today? Here is really the t-shirt, I have one. encourage you to think about buying a t-shirt as like a trigger. Some other ways that you could do that, well, there are copies of, uh, of Kai Parahuarahi, which is um, the youth work journal for Aotearoa New Zealand. It's a really amazing edition, that first one. There's 18 reflections on ethical practice from across the motu. Um, and the really exciting, there's been a few kind of world first launchy type situations here, and one thing that I would really Rod, is, Rod may well get a little bit embarrassed about this, but there's actually, he and Trissel have worked on, in order to get it here for Involve 2018, it is the launch of the second edition of the Supervision Scrapbook. It is amazing. It's 80 something pages of supervisory goodness. Um, we've got some proof copies, but you can um, order your copy from the Involved Desk, which is downstairs. The other Taohi Desk, behind the Involved Desk, maybe? One of the desks. There's desks. One of the desks. You can order. There's Thank desks. you. Go down. <coughs> Put your order in. Cool. Thank you. Um, all right. Just a couple of other housekeeping things. Keep the hashtag alive. We want to get uh, trending on everything, especially Twitter. Follow on Twitter. In fact, get out your phones right now if you like. Use your phones during this if you're bored of listening to our voices. At InvolveNZ is the primary Twitter account. 
and on any social media platform, you can hashtag InvolveNZ. My favourite question from yesterday was, how many outfits can Anya wear in one day? Start counting today. The Involve Artworks. Uh, the Involve Artworks. So we just want to... Um, actually, I might even zoom backwards. And... Oh, show you this one. This uh, piece of art was commissioned from a young artist called Huriana, who um, produced some really, really uh, amazing images around, you'll see them on screens around the conference. We think this image is beautiful and kind of perfectly uh, manifests our, our theme for Involve 2018, so mihi to Huriana. And also to the young artists from Zeal who have, um, who have, uh, produced artworks for each of our keynotes, so you will have seen uh, a little bag being given to um, keynotes as they finish, and that includes some artwork by a young person from Zeal. Cool, kia ora. Uh, a notice about stalls. If you have a stall, we need you to totally be packed up by 6.15 p.m. tonight. That is totally non-negotiable because a few minutes after that, the wonderful people who set up the tables and screens for you are coming to dismantle them and take them away. So all stalls must be packed up, all your gear out of here by 6.15 p.m., please. And that's a good thing, especially if you're coming to the after party, which is at 7.30 p.m. in the Harb uh, Lion Harbour rooms. Over that way. We'd love you all to come. Cool. Um, one other thing. One other thing. Stall related. Our corridor uh, yesterday afternoon about the youth development strategy, that conversation will be sustained over the course of the day. There are two amazing people from the Centre for Social Impact down on the ground floor who are really keen to talk to you about your further ideas around um, the state of youth development and the future of youth development in Aotearoa. There's some interactive activities. They really want to hear from you, so go hang out with them. Their names are Kat and Kate, and they're very friendly. And finally, in terms of accessibility and whare paku, if today's your first day or you still haven't found them yet, there are gender neutral toilets on the top floor, on the top floor of this building are gender neutral toilets, and on the ground floor are accessible whare paku for tane and wahine. Um, also, I've been given some feedback as an MC. I really appreciate feedback. Apparently, I said the word straddling too many times yesterday. I'm making a real effort not to say it today. Thank you for your feedback. I don't know what that was about. I had no consciousness. No consciousness about straddling. I don't even know what the word means or why it's relevant. I'm apologizing for straddling so much. Let's think about today. Here's the program. It's the same structure as yesterday. Any minute, we're about to welcome Glenn onto the stage. Morning tea is at 10.30. Remember, it's a generous morning tea time and you want to be early for the workshops. We heard sadly that people were turned away from breakout sessions yesterday because of capacity. So if there's one that you are absolutely dying to get to and you're in a powerful conversation at morning tea, tell that person, we've got to walk and talk, baby, and get to the breakout sessions. The breakout sessions have been very punctual and will start at 11.15. 12.30 is lunch. Breakout session four starts at 2.15. It's easy to lose track of time when lunch is that long, so keep an eye on the clock. At 3.45, we've got our closing address in here with Dr. Michelle Johansson. And Blackfriars. And Blackfriars. That would be amazing. That is a non-missable thing. Totally compulsory, and then we're going to have a brief wrap-up and be done before five. We've got three changes to the program, so please pull out your programs and turn to page... 13 to start with. Could you please role model this for me like a, like a model? With um, This lectern has a really thin ledge. It's quite stressful. All right, on page 13, um, bounce is replaced because bounce bounced into yesterday's session instead with a session called Utilising Cultural Markers to Better Engage Māori, Rangatahi and Fano in your services. That um, session is a few pages prior and remember to go on involve.org.nz to read the full abstract and to click the link you can add the sessions to your calendar. That's a great idea because you'll get a notification on your phone reminding you where the venue is and if there happens to be any last minute changes to venues which are not going to happen then uh, you'll also be notified. So do add the breakouts to your calendars and utilising cultural markers is replacing bounce on page 13. We also have two changes in breakout four. Um, is Michael Hempseed in the room? Okay, is this confirmed, Michael? 
It is confirmed. Michael was so popular yesterday with his session on unaddressed causes of suicide because the most amount of people were turned away from that session. Thank you, Michael, for offering to repeat that session, um, which is going to be, instead of Katie Aitchison's uh, New South Wales Youth Development Framework, which was in Breakout 1 yesterday. So Katie Aitchison has already offered that session in Breakout 1, and instead, if you missed Michael Hempseed with unaddressed causes of suicide, you can see it on the, the bottom session in page 14. What room is that, Anya? It's the Frank Taplin room, which is behind us. And finally, the final third change is that um, Chris Martin is unavailable to be here, sadly, on page 15. So Chris Martin's session, uh, which was values-based, co-design is replaced with Dickie Humphreys' mana-centred leadership. Those are all the changes that we are aware of today. Okay, Anya, tell us about Glenn. Oh, one last thing before Anya introduces Glenn. Uh, if we have time with Glenn, we are running late because of um, stragglers, Not close to straddling, Not stragglers. Um, so uh, we want to honour Glenn's time and give him as much time as possible. If we have capacity, um, we will open Slido for questions. Um, so slido.com hashtag InvolveNZ is the password. If you want the Wi-Fi, it's Venues Wellington, no password. If you want to ask Glenn a question, use Slido. And if we have time, I'll leap up at the end and see if we can activate it. If we don't have time, which is highly likely, um, Glenn will see the questions and you can approach him to ask later. Is that cool with you? Cool with me. Glenn Colhoun. So when... <laughs> Dead, it's upside down. So when we were dreaming, doing some early dreaming about um, the program and what needed to be on it, we, we realised that actually in order to really help us to fully explore this theme, we needed to find edge walkers. We needed to find people who actually walk between worlds and navigate the spaces between um, professional identities, ways of working, practices, methods, and I don't know if any of you have read Late Love, but when I read this book, I, it just it perfectly articulated so many things that I've been thinking about in relation to our world and the youth development sector, and in, in, in relationship um, to what, what we're trying to do actually with this conference. And one of the early conversations that the Involve Organising Committee were having was like, who are these people who walk between worlds? Because actually that's what we know our young people are doing. Who are these people who can translate between the, the professional discourse of medicine and the professional discourse of kind of positive youth development? And Glenn Colhoun is one of those people. But not only is he one of those people who kind of um, blends professional identity, uh, a little bit of context for this, so if you haven't read Late Love, um, it's basically about a, a journey um, as a, someone working to support young people's well-being that has ended up him kind of with him blending different professional identities because none of them actually um, did all of the things that his, the young people that he was working with needed from him. He's also an amazing writer and poet and um, I've read all of his books. I was like, Rod, I don't think I can, I'm, I actually think my brain's going to explode if I have to introduce Glenn Colhoun because I've read everything, I think I've read everything that he's written. I'm so excited about him coming to kind of light up this theme for us to talk about um, words and well-being and young people and uh, the places that he's worked and grown to understand. I'd, re I'd really love you all to give him a massive round of applause as he joins us uh, on stage for the opening keynote this morning. Thank you. 
I'm not sure why you're asking a man who has to change glasses um, to speak to at a youth conference. Um, but it's very progressive of you, thank you. Um, I have to say too, I was hoping that the announcements would just keep going on and on, um, so it left me less time to ramble in front of you. Um, I'm a bit nervous because my manager, I work at a place called the Horofenua Youth Health Service, we're part of YOS, um, one of the big YOSs in Palmerston North, and my manager got on a train at six o'clock this morning to come down here, um, and I think it's probably my performance review um, <laughs> this year, so if you could give me lots of applause, that would be... And, and also, just to get some protocols clear, um, I'm going to read you some poems when I shut up um, rambling uh, this morning that I've written about young people, about the young people I work with, because um, I think they say things better uh, than me um, gabbing on. Um, but people never know, because usually when I read poems, it's just to four or five old people in the Levin Public Library. Um, so people never quite know what to do at the end of poems, whether to say, no. I'll be very clear, I want you just to give riotous applause at the end of each poem, um, whether you like it or not. As we say to our young people, just fake it till you make it. Um, uh, I work as a GP, um, but really I was listening to Sue Bagshaw yesterday saying that she sees herself as a youth worker first and foremost who does some medicine. And I guess uh, working with young people has changed me uh, from being a doctor at the beginning and after 10 years of doing that uh, towards uh, being a youth worker because what I've found is that anything useful I do with young people actually uses the skills uh, of being a youth worker. And I've worked beside many amazing youth workers and had to go and pinch their skills and the ways they work to bring it back into the clinic uh, to get some traction. Um, and over the time, as all of you know, working with young people, um, their stories are very compelling. And in my other life as a writer, I'm always drawn to story. And a while back, I thought it would be nice to start writing to the young people that I see at the clinic who come and see me. Because a consultation has a set time frame. And I always have this feeling sometimes at the end of consultations of, I wish I had said that, or I wish I had said this. Um, and sometimes I'll see that young person again, but sometimes I won't. So I thought it would be nice, and sometimes I want to go away and consider what they're talking to me about and consider what my response to them might be. So I thought I would like to start writing them letters. Um, I remember also another influence on that idea was going to a Saipans conference a few years back. And someone suggested when we wrote Heads Assessment that we didn't write them for other doctors uh, or health professionals to read, uh, but that we wrote them to the young person. So I started off by going back and writing Heads Assessment to my young people, which completely changed um, uh, the language that I used, the vernacular, uh, and also the way I thought about them. And I guess these poems have grown out of those experiments in language as much as anything, and in address. Um, so over the years I've been writing to my young people, and I have quite a few poems now um, that are all types of letters. Um, and I thought I would read you something from the introduction. Um, and some of the poems. I need to say right up at, at the beginning too, you know, young people change us. This is the great joy for me of working with young people. And they've changed my poetry. They've forced me to write letters to them. But also, I know that young people are bored shitless by poetry, um, especially the poetry I write. Um, 
And I've had these, when I write the poem to them, I get the young person in and I give a poem to them and say, I've written you a poem. And I read them the poem. And I've realised that there's no place in New Zealand society, there's no way we're taught to act when your doctor calls you in and says, I've written a poem for you. <laughs> and there's some quite hard customers that we see. And when I tell them that I've written them a poem, there's this look of perpetual awkwardness on their face. Um, but nevertheless, they listen. I think they're more touched by the fact that someone thought to write to them um, than about the poem. They insist they know what it's talking about, but I don't even know what it's talking about. So, so I'm not sure they do. But they've changed. Some young people, I think, no, this poem is going to bore you. I need to write something from your vernacular, something from the way you see poetry. And of course, nowadays, um, people are using spoken word poetry, young people especially, and rap. And, you know, there's some amazing rap lyrics coming out um, that really are poems, and very old poems in a sense, because all poems at the beginning were, were sung, were oral poems. And we live in a country with two poetries, one that's written in English, but one that's sung, chanted, declaimed uh, in Te Reo Māori. Um, so I'm just I'm telling you this for me. I have written a rap to one of our young people, but you can see I'm an old, bald, white man. Um, so I might chicken out towards the end of the session, so please don't let me chicken out. While I'm brave, make sure I do my rap for you. Um, and if you think you can do it better, please take it. I'm sure you're right. Um, I thought I would start by reading one of the early poems um, I wrote to a young man. Um, and all the young people that I'm reading about have said it's okay to read their poems and I've changed all their names so, um, so they feel more comfortable at that. Although most of them wanted their names on it but I said no. <laughs> Um, and I know there's a whole lot that are going to be pissed off that I haven't written to them. Um, but this young man, uh, I've changed his name to Michael. And he was born with a kidney condition called um, focal segmental um, glomerulosclerosis. And that's a kidney condition that is slowly destroying his kidneys. And he's been in and out of hospital from the time he was 18 months old. Um, and he's on the list for a a kidney transplant. Um, and so he's suffered, and he's been on lots of really strong medications that have affected him. And I wanted to write to him about that journey he's going through um, and what to do when something doesn't get better. Because in medicine, lots of times things don't get better at, uh, as opposed to what might be seen on the TV. And I wanted the challenge of writing to him about that. I also wanted to see if it was possible to write a poem about focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. Um, there's always a challenge to a poet to, to write a poem about something that's not very poetic. Um, so bear with me and remember, um, riotous praise at the end works wonders. Um, this poem is called Letter to Michael for a young man with focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. Jesus, brother, I don't know what to say. It's hard to argue fucking kidneys. I wish I could make them better. Call them something sweeter, perhaps. Fresh plums ripe and dripping over the back fence. Or something sharper, perhaps, Colt 45s, pearl handled, snug on the hips, for all the good that would do. I could show you pictures in a book, take you in closer, glomerulus, Basement membrane, podocyte, 
show you how the whole thing tangles. As though somewhere in all of that, if we could only examine the exact circumstances, then things might be different. Getting to the nub of the problem might do the trick. Like changing a washer or meeting a neighbour you've been arguing with. Perhaps, I think, God himself might meet us there and see sense. That unreasonableness might disappear in the right light, but it won't. There will still be this divide with you on one side and me on the other. The best I can hope for is to wait, talk about it from time to time, ask about the weather. There is something about light when it inhabits that has nothing to do with how it got there or where it disappears to next. It just is. I see that in you sometimes. When you get the chance, walk along the top of an old brick fence, your arms outstretched like you did when you were a kid, balancing. You can live inside moments like that. Get it right and you'll have more time than people who live twice as long. And when you think you've had enough, strip back an old chair, layer after layer. Put it back together, better than before. Sit it in your room with glued up vases, flowers burst, and learn to love the broken thing. Thank you. Um, I have to say too, sometimes when I've read the poems, people say, can I get a copy? And I'm very happy to give people a copy, of course, um, because they work with young people and, and, and many of the things we see, you see as well. Um, so if you, think some, if you hear something and you think that'll be useful for somebody I know, come and see me, or I've got a website with my name, glenncahoon.net. If you go on there, flick me a, a message and I'll send, one day I'll publish the book, but it, it's still probably 12 months away. Um, it has to sit for a while and shake down. I still, when I read the poems, want to get a pen and change words here and there. Um, I want to read you a poem for a young person um, called Bobby Lee. And um, one thing I see a lot is young people who come and see me with many, many, many different diagnoses um, from, from seeing mental health, many, many, many different mental health um, uh, agencies. And everyone they see, they seem to pick up a new diagnosis. And sometimes half my job is taking the diagnosis and getting rid of it. Um, because I think sometimes what our young people struggle with is, is their story. Um, and their story is a long thing that you have to tell. It's not something that can be condensed into a few letters. So I see people coming in with ADD and ADHD and ODD and BAD and BPD and all these things. And I think it's impossible for someone to have all those things. Um, and this young woman had a big story and had been traumatised many times in her life, both by people close to her, but also by a, um, a state organisation that had bounced her around lots of different caregivers who had not always been kind to her. So uh, she had a lot of ache and pain buried away in the nooks and crannies of her life that had unfortunately taken on these letters. And I got annoyed at the letters because 
Young people worry about them. They think that thing that those letters talk about is a thing, but it's not. Yeah, it's a description. And so sometimes it's giving young people back their story, taking away our story for them and giving them their story. So this is a poem for Bobby Lee. It's called A Diagnosis for Bobby Lee. No, 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 no. Don't listen to a word of it. A-D-D, O-D-D, B-A-D, B-P-D, F-U-C-K-O-F-F. I count. Two arms, two legs, a heart, a mind. I cannot find a letter anywhere. If it were up to me, I might say simply that you are sad. But sad is okay. It is meant to be here in the great knot of the heart, there is a wound. The wound is called, do you love me? We all have it. Perhaps you are unsure. My friend is unsure. The man next door is unsure. I am unsure. Fear lives on shoulders. It is a parrot. Then again, you may be hungry. Then again, you may be angry. Anger is hungry. Here where the great arteries arise, prize them apart a little. Leave a pie. You alone will not be enough to eat. There is nothing else to say. In time you might plant a seed and watch it grow. Pick up a child and hold them to you. Set your eye on the end of a beach and walk towards it. With any luck, one day you might look back on where you have come from. You might rest in the shade of a tree. You might become that child you hold in your arms. As for everyone else, tell them you are made of earth and sky. Tell them. You have come through. Tell them you already have a name. Tell them it is Bobby Lee. Um, I see lots of young men um, who struggle with being angry and drinking a lot um, and not liking, not liking themselves very much. Um, and these things seem to chase each other round and round and round in their lives. And there's a young man that... Um, I know well, um, and his name is Hemi, and we had been talking about these things and how they worked in his life. Um, when I went back up what I, to where I call home, up in um, the Bay of Islands, and um, 
as you do when you go up there. I got to Pai here and I thought my great-great-grandfather is buried in Russell um, in Kororareka in the old Christ Church there. I thought I'd go see him. And I got off the ferry in Russell and um, I saw this magnificent fish um, hanging up on a gantry by the tail and all these men standing around measuring the trace because it, it was kind of a record catch. And they were all drinking beer and wearing their shorts and gloating. And I've caught lots of fish up in Bay of Islands. Uh, but when I looked up at that fish, I thought, this seems not fair in some way. Um, and while they were celebrating, the gore was running down the fish and someone was hosing it down and then it got let down off the gantry and put on the back of the boat. Um, and I started to think about my young person. Uh, I started to think about Hemi um, and the way he was caught up, uh, hung up on his own gantry. Um, and poetry's like that sometimes, writing, the imagination, medicine, youth work. We see one thing while we're thinking about another thing and then they marry into each other and an answer and a door opens up. So I thought I would write this poem to Hemi about the fish um, and read it for you. It's called One That Got Away. I saw a fish the other day, brother. It was magnificent. Men in shorts were standing around it, drinking and talking in their men voices. Yeah, nah, shit, nah, they said, and nah, yeah, shit, yeah. <laughs> the fish hung from a crane pointing downwards. A rope had been tied around its tail. It bled from a slit the length of its belly and from the gills and from a hole in the side where the gaff had gone in. It seemed puzzled more than anything else, wondering about our world without float. What sport this was and how it brought pleasure. From its mouth snaked the trace, curled on the wharf, delicate with gore. I imagined the hook at its end, its pull deep and sharp, the lure that drew it in. What was the difference between its life and mine. We shared the same sinew and spine. We shared the same sky. We shared the same kick, the same gasp, and the same wild eye. For a moment then, the fish became my mother. It became my brother. It became my push, my pull, my priest, my friend. It became the lost, the found, the sad, the near do well, the poor, the homeless, the patched up, the misunderstood. It became you sucking from the bottle, lighting up, sticking the boot into yourself over and over again, every one a hook of one sort or another. Life had so recently sat inside the thing I thought it could not have gone very far away, dripped from it still, in the pat, pat, pat of tear, blood, sea, 
from the tip of its silently offered sword. Perhaps it was sitting at that very moment on a nearby bollard, looking back at itself, the past flashing by, the future leaving without it. Did it feel once more the weight of good in all those ordinary decisions made to eat, care, exist, go on? Was it by reflex or rage? Or did it consider only the remarkable privilege of life itself? Whatever that case, with that thought alone to prod, its raw and bloodshot eye caught mine, swung round to see if the coast was clear. And while the voices were busy bearing and telling and measuring the trace, I saw the grit set in. In that moment, the thing bore down, fought back, Released at last like some long coiled spring, it arched its back, thrashed its head from side to side, gave a flick of its tail to rise up and free of the gantry, describing as it did so a single perfect parabola to the sea. The men scattered, yeah, nah, shit, years, seagulling from the wharf in every direction. I ran to the water then and watched the fish slip beneath the waves. There, it was in its element again. Even the men with the bear gathered and were glad for it. In time, everyone turned round, went back to their day, as if they'd seen all they were going to. But somewhere, deep down, in some great cavernous space, I felt its joy and pain and knew that these could not go unspoken. In that moment, the sea flinched, its surface caught, drawn down into itself, by some secret pull, as fathoms deep, the fish began to rise again. Past refuse and wreck, its colours pierced, its eye held true. Like some meteor reversed in time, it drove upwards into the sky. Free of limit for a moment, it hung, godlike, proud, Sail hoist, begged, wild and free, as though passing on its way between worlds and startled by seeing itself for the first time. Beyond it fell, changed forever, plunging back into what seemed, into what seemed like then a different sea. The hook spat sharp into the wharf, remained ruined and small. This I wish for you, brother. This I wish for you, at least. Um, just two or three more, and um, then we'll, we'll let you off. Um, I feel like it's become an English class. Um, <clears throat> I'll be testing you on your knowledge of metaphor and simile um, at some point. Uh, 
uh, some of the young people we see, or well, many of the young people we see at the clinic have been through um, uh, different types of trauma in their early life and many of them suffer um, the effects of that. And this poem I wrote <clears throat> to a young person at our clinic who rarely comes to see us but who often texts. So we have spent hours and hours texting back and forth, her telling me things about her life, sometimes just things about her day and me responding to that. Um, from time to time I see her, but most of our conversations happen by texting. Um, and she <clears throat> had been uh, sexually abused for six years by her stepfather. Um, and this has coloured her life in many, many different ways. She's also remarkably resilient um, and cheeky and funny. Um, and we have great conversations and it's hard to think of a patient who's changed my mind more um, than this young person. Um, I feel like <clears throat> doctors are supposed to fix things, you know. Um, I feel like I've emptied all my bullets into this young person. Then I pulled out the other gun and emptied all those bullets. Yeah. And I feel like school emptied all their bullets into her and the mental health system em emptied their bullets. And still, she carries on in her world of coping and not coping at the same time. And I'm left to be her friend and to keep talking to her. Um, she gives me a bloody nose at least every two weeks, sits me on my ass, makes me come up with better explanations for things. It's one of the great... I try to convey to her that she is a great gift to me. As a pa Our patients are huge gifts to us to teach us how to be in medicine, and I suspect our clients in youth work. So I'll read this... She always wanted to be called Paige. Most of the young people, when I ask them what I should change their name to, they've all got names they wish they were called. Um, so she wishes she was called Paige. The problem is there's other pages in the clinic, so they'll think this poem's about them. Um, anyway, this is called Letter to Paige. Um, sometimes there's nothing to do but keep on going. That's all the medicine there is to it. Rise in the morning, get out of bed, wash your face, clean your teeth, say to the day, hello day, shall we be friends? No one wants to mow the lawns, for God's sake, but we do. We watch them pout on the way to the letterbox. The sun and the rain are against us, for sure. So we go to the shed. We pull the cord. We put one foot in front of the other. And we go around in circles. It is the same with our clothes, collapsed to the floor. How they pile sedimentary. We lift them up, smooth along their seams, stop them turning into stone. It is the same with loving ourselves. Hatred is a pile of dirty dishes, stacked like a city, all angle and filth, grubby towered and demanding. At some point we run the water, squirt the soap, pick up a cloth and begin. We take our hands and soak them, count the bones, feel them warm. We take our ribs, twelve at least, run a finger along each groove. At some point, quick as a flash, our skin is off 
among the shoals. And here, where our memories have been burnt black into the pot, we know enough from cobbled fingers to simply let them soak. Surviving is enough for now. It is not much to say, I care, well met. I see you there beneath the load, but it is all I have. I will leave the words anyway wrapped in paper, like fish and chips, just in case. Think of it as an inoculation placed under your skin. Perhaps it might rise when the hating comes. I would be happy if it said, no, this man, simple as a stone and good, loves me, says I am to go on. One day you will say it to yourself. Slowly in time, the mountain will come down to size, stare you in the eye. We grow into ourselves. There is something in us made to heal, the way the tree is made to grow and the bird to fly. In the meantime, breathe. Take in water and wait for the wind to find you. Don't underestimate the strength it takes to stand still, appear in your day each day. In the time it has taken for you to read this, you have travelled 10,000 miles. One day you will arrive in yourself like a stranger from a distant land and feel at home without ever knowing you'd left. Love will stumble across you. The sun reach into the darkest corner and warm. Sometimes we work the far paddock, leave this one to sky and earth. Um, should I do my rap? Yeah. You're not allowed to laugh at me though, eh? Like, it's an old man rap. Um, and I can remember it, but in front of all you people I know I will forget it. So I'm going to sort of look at it while I do it. And I'm, this is a picture of my daughter. She's 15, and she's really embarrassed about her dad. <laughs> Which, so I thought I would put this here, because I love pissing her off. Yeah. And if you do, like if you film this, and you send it out there, you just tell her, her name's Oriwa, Put it on, I don't know, there's all these things you can put shit on now, eh? I don't even know, <laughs> like something called Facebook or something like that. You can tell her, you say, Olive, your dad is a mean as motherfucker, okay? <laughs> if you just, this, <laughs> a bad ass gangster, yeah? Uh, <laughs> um, I can only do things like this in front of my daughter because I know, I, who cares about what our kids think of us? That's the beautiful thing about getting old. So I couldn't do it in front of all of you, but I can do it in front of her. Um, this is for a young man at our clinic who sort of, you know, well, he's, he's a great kid and everybody loves him and he's full of personality. And he's sort of grown up a little bit in the hood 
but he comes out with all these komatua sayings at times and you think, oh brother, where are you? What? You're like the 21st century and the 17th century all combined together and he's figuring himself out and there's such goodness in him and such struggle sometimes. Um, and we worked with him, I, I first met him in alternative education where we ran a cooking class for some of the kids but then he's had some quite nasty dental uh, malformations and so we wanted to get um, some braces for him but of course the, the quote for that was six or seven thousand dollars and the orthodontist gave us a discount and then we created a give a little page and we, we managed to raise that money for him. Um, there's another whole story about access to dental care for some of our young people who are over 18 um, and, and the government's response to that. But anyway, we raise the money and every, two, every three or four weeks we take him up to Palmy and he gets his braces on and we have great conversations in the car and he sort of fancies all the dental nurses and he, they, they're ready for him now and he's got little lines for each of them. And um, anyway, I, went, I wanted to write to him about those two sides of himself and I wanted to write about his teeth um, and it just felt wrong to write him a letter poem because... Uh, He's someone who would value a rat more. So it's the hardest poem in the book for me to write because it has its own cadence and I've loved the opportunity to have a crack at it. Um, so please forgive me. Um, and um, he, would, he would definitely, as an extrovert, want me to tell you his name, but I won't. We'll just call him David. Um, and the... This is called Eruptions, um, and please bear with me. For David, for a young man with braces. Sup, brother, sup, brother. Kicking it up and such, brother. Got this pitter patter tripping through the grey matter. Got to say first up, good to see you, much love. Got to say it twice, too. Cause everyone is kinda too, I see that in you sometimes Some shadow, some shine, kinda sentence, kinda rhyme Like a light come through a blind One brother from the hood, another from the good book Ali Fraser, doof doof, uppercut and left hook See the fight go back and forth, cavalry and crazy horse Frodo and that bloody ring, Jesus in Gethsemane I remember that day, holding up the x-ray One tooth in the way, the other sitting in the shade Sometimes I think that's just like you, kind of rough, kind of smooth. I'm cheering for your big heart, for the light to beat the dark. Cheering for Red Riding Hood, gobble up that ugly wolf. Back in the old days, back before the Bible says, for the shit in old ways. Other side of Ice Age, we were fish, go figure that. Carried teeth upon our back, had to wait a million years for them to end up in our heads. All I'm saying, roundabout, out of shadow of a doubt, all of us are still to come, none of us is said and done. Robert Frost came across in a yellow wood once, Undisturbed, unperturbed, undercurbed to pass the verge. To the left, be my guest. To the right, she'll be right. In a while, crocodile took the one less travelled by. Later made the inference, that made all the difference. Even Maui took stock, floating on his top knot. Had to get old school before he got too cool. Tried to find the right door, tried to do the either all. Had to rub a old jaw, find the man inside the boy. That's all I want to say, love you brother anyway, be who you were meant to be, write your own damn history. This mihi's all done, off the paper, on the tongue, catch you one day in the sun, tahiru a torufa, catch you in the by and by, love you brother, coke and pie, catch you in the by and by, love you brother, coke and pie. <laughs> Um, so I read, that was the last poem I, read, I wrote, and I realised I've got to go back and rewrite the whole collection as rap now. Because um, <laughs> once they hear that, they'll all want that one and not their old man white person poems. So I want to finish with a, a waiata, um, because going back to that point I made, New Zealand has two poetries, if I can put my poetry head on. Um, and we have this wonderful existing oral tradition of Māori poetry. 
and many of the young people we see are Māori. And there was young, one young woman, um, and we had a fantastic conversation. She had grown up in Kura, and she was fluent in Te Reo Māori. And she heard that I was writing some more te atea. And at the end of our consultation, she asked me about those. And the consultation was hard. She suffers from a skin disease called scleroderma. Um, and that causes all the skin to tighten. Um, and she's a young woman. It also causes some other problems with the internal organs. And she's been, re she's been lost to her specialist care lots and lots and lots of times and appointments she doesn't show up to, medications she doesn't always take. And we had the consultation, and it's always a nagging consultation. You missed the appointment, what should we do? Should we try again? How can we help you? But it's kind of naggy. At the end of that, she asked me about writing more teatea, and she asked me to sing her one that I was working on for my daughter. And we sang that to her, and I was very shy to do that. I sang it to her, and immediately the tears came to her eyes. And we had this whole other consultation, and it poured out how she had been hurt um, when she was learning te reo and speaking it by people who had expectations of her within her whānau. And things came pouring out, and she realised just how much she loved that world and how much it still spoke to her. Um, so I thought it would be nice to write something for her about um, surfaces and what's underneath them would be about her skin and what lies underneath it, but also what lies on the surface of a consultation and what lies underneath that. So it's a different cadence from a rap, um, but I thought it was a nice place to finish with a song. So um, I'll sing it to you in Te Reo Māori and then um, read it to you in English. Um, and thank you very much for listening to me. Um, and for being so spontaneously generous in your applause. Um, <laughs> I hope you en enjoy the rest uh, of the conference. Um, it's fabulous to cross-pollinate and see everybody's ideas and how everyone's working. Um, and, yeah, um, my best wishes to all of you. This, uh, this is called He Mōte Atea. Mo te tahi tai tamahini e whātoro ana, tōna kiri. E nei tō mai rangi he tū, tūru nei ki tā whiri rangi. Ka me me hā kā puta, ngā aka o tā whaki. Ka puta ko punga, he mata ko kiri. Kei raro i te tumu o pōhutu kawa. Kei raro i te tuhu whera o te moana. He kau pai e haere i hoa i. He uhi no te kiko kiko karere, te tirai raka mai i te kiri ki te ngākau mai i. Te ngākau ki te kiri E nei kupu i wainga I a taua He rā rangi pātai He rā rangi whaka utu Ko e nā E rā ko e nā Noa, ka pahe mō rātau ka puta, te ngaro e noho ana i te āta, hei wai āta ko te manu, hei wai āta ko te manu. These clouds.
passing now over Tafiridangi. Where they dissolve, I can see Tafaki's vines appearing. And who is that in the distance? If not Punga plummeting out of the sky like a meteor. Where Pahutakawa buries his knuckles in the soil. And there in the distance where the sea opens and closes. I swear I see footsteps. Skin too is unreliable. Every day fantails fly between it and the heart. These words passing now back and forth. Me asking questions, you answering them. Is that all that is said between us? One day they will grow tired and unravel. One day that child waiting in shadow will stumble out into the light and be given voice. Kia ora. Cool. Um, thank you, Glenn. I think we are going to make the time five minutes. We started at quarter two. We're going to finish at quarter two because I think that's about honouring you, Glenn, and honouring the young people and the stories that you've shared with us today. We started the session late. We're going to finish late. And that's totally cool because our next session doesn't start until quarter past, OK? And also because I'm a mean-ass motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. I was about to say that too. <laughs> hey, Shannon from the Arataroahi team um, ran or sent a runner to Unity Books where we bought the very last copy of Late Love, Glenn's book called Sometimes Doctors Need Saving As Much As Their Patients. This is the best $15 you will ever spend. And one of you will not need to spend that because Glenn is going to choose somebody to give that to and perhaps you'd even want to write something to that person based on our Slido questions. So Glenn's favourite question. If you've got a question, quickly jump in now to Slido. There's quite a lot in here about um, straddling and other things. But I think uh, we'll look at the most common questions we've got. Well, maybe, Glenn, just like two or three questions, right? Yep. So Anonymous asks, what would you say, Glenn, is the most pivotal, valued lesson learned from other youth workers that you have implemented into your practice? Um, it's a great question, and there's many, many different things, but the most pivotal thing is that there's no tricks. You just you find a way to like that person, even if you don't like them. That's why you like them. Um, you find a way to like them, and this is a gift to you, to teach us how to love better. You find a way, and you stick like glue, um, and wait. And, yeah, I think it's the law, it's, it's playing the long game, I think. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Um, the screen that we see up here, I mean, you can see at the top there are 41 questions. Um, and so we can't quite see all of them up here, but there is one that has a lot of votes from um, M and another one from Brit. So Brit asked, this was actually one of the first questions that popped up. Brit asked, have any taohi written to you in return? Have any taohi written to you in return? Um, no one's written a poem back. People have written emails or texts um, back which can be beautiful. Just yesterday, it was a, it's the most lovely thing, sitting here in the middle, listening to a, a discussion, and I got a text from a young person who's in Tauranga now, but who we keep in touch with, and she had been through, again, unspeakable traumas, and we only interacted with her three or four times. Her life is full of chaotic moments, and she came in, back into our area and then left again. But it's a 
text after not hearing from her for three or four months out of the blue to say, hey, Glenn and Michelle, who works with me, just wanted you to know I'm doing really well. Um, and I told you I'd keep in touch. And usually I get a text, I think, oh, what now? Who wants something? <laughs> and it's so nice to be just, that's all it was, just I'm doing really well. I still have really down days, but I'm doing great, and I wanted you guys to know. And, and I think, yeah, they do stay, and we get random emails and texts from kids, as I'm sure you all do, which is such, such a neat thing. So, yeah. Cool, thank you. And M's question, my phone keeps refreshing, uh, it's got seven votes. M asks, what about those of us who find those diagnoses empowering and relieving and connecting and an essential part of our self-management and recovery? The team in the background here behind the curtain are probably looking for this question. I'll just read it again. What about those of us who find those diagnoses empowering and relieving and connecting and an essential part of our self-management and recovery? Yeah, look, and, and, and I wouldn't stand in the way of that. And, and to give a balanced response, um, you know, I think any self-definition, I think when you have the power to define who you are, and that's in a diagnosis, that's fabulous. But m I would say, for the young people I see, probably 80 to 90% don't find that empowering, and they have multiple diagnoses. And I don't think the, diag I think the diagnoses confound what is actually going on in their story. And I, don't, I think those diagnoses accumulate in, in um, oranga tamariki notes, in medical notes, in um, school notes, I think. And sometimes a person might only have been seen once for one conversation and that diagnosis appears. So a diagnosis that's considered by someone who knows you over time and has a relationship with you and expertise, I think can be a really powerful thing. But for those young people who have engaged and engaged and engaged, ended up with multiple diagnoses, um, that actually don't mean a lot to them, then I think it's not, and they aren't included, in, and they don't use them to define who they, they're not relevant to the way they define themselves, then I think um, they need peeling off and starting again. So I think both ways are possible. To me, it's about who is doing the defining and, and what care and consideration and reflection has been put into that. Mm, kia ora, Glenn. As you think about which of those questions you want to award this book to, I'm just going to read the back paragraph of late love. As a youth worker, doctor, and award-winning poet and children's writer, Glenn Calcoon has led a life lived in two parts. Writing and reading has always transported him to a world flickered by colour, warmth, and connection. We saw that today. Meanwhile, his work as a GP in the Horo Whenua has confronted him daily with scenes of doubt, dislocation and disadvantage. Late love is a meeting of these worlds, a moving attempt to show what it is, as a doctor and writer, to be alongside people. Thank you for being alongside us today. Who wins the book, Glenn? I, I, that person, the last question, I love it when people argue with me. Whoever was arguing, come and see Glenn on the side of the stage and we'll hook you up with this. Could we, uh, before we depart this um, room, oh, one Panui, Anya's not here right now, this is good. Remember that this is her last week working as the Executive Officer of Aratahi. If you would love to send her some warm wishes, there's a whiteboard downstairs that we're collecting some um, affirmations for her down by the New Zealand Youth Mentoring Network stall. As on your way out, could we please start by standing and showing our appreciation for Glenn. Thank you. Thank you.